Um, just, just to fill you in a little bit about um, what I think um, kinetic art is and, and why I'm um, doing this demonstration or this presentation more than a demonstration. It's really something that um, if, you, if you're into wood turning, as obviously we all are here, um, even on the um, show and tell bench tonight, you'll see a few items there that don't necessarily or haven't necessarily come off the lathe. But that doesn't make them any less valid. But if you actually go down that um, track a bit further, you'll find out there's people out there, predominantly on the internet, and there's one um, person who I ref refer to a bit more to as a guy called um, David C. Roy. And I'll put up a little bit more information about him, but he does um, a lot of stuff. But before we, before we get on to that, I'll just run through the what well, I've put up a very loose agenda up there. And right at the top, I've put up... Um, kinetic art definitions. I was hoping somebody might be able to tell me what it was. No? Okay, well, it's really um, items that um, basically, kinetic art really is woodwork creations that have arguably some form um, or some sort of function. Um, they usually have some sort of form as well. It's a bit arguable about that sometimes, but they impart a level of interest and enjoyment by being able to move in particular ways. So it's um, it's um, stuff that's um, interesting. It's not, we're not talking about um, toys and models. We're talking more along the lines of um, things that are wall hangings or pendulums or stuff that moves along on those lines. Yeah, mobiles don't. Yeah, in a way, it's, it, that's, that's true. There's a, having said that they're not, not like models and toys, there's a huge overlap in the skill set. I've seen some marvellous stuff in, here, even recently, of models and uh, that people have made, that stuff which is just brilliant. But if you, those are the same sort of skill sets that typically uh, need to be deployed. And then why I came unstuck a wee bit, and I'll come on to that, into what I was going to show you tonight, and we'll talk a bit, 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 bit more that, a bit more about that um, further on. So what you're going to see tonight is actually what I managed to put together, and also what I failed to put together. But I figured that it's really uh, in the interest of sort of warts and all. Um, I'm going to show what I've done and over the course of the next few club meetings perhaps that maybe show and tells I'll make a commitment to show where that's got to so you um, just moving on to the um, first slide this is a an example of a thing called um, uh, it's called antipods uh, this is by a guy called um, Dolph um, Parenti it's about probably about eight years old based on when the that YouTube video was posted um, it's been copied by a number of other people and if you actually um, if you do a search on antipods you'll find a few other versions of it um, ironically one of the people who made quite a, an interesting copy of this um, he said it in the bit that I read at the end it said it took him many attempts and many failed trials to finally get his version to work and it's something I probably should have paid a bit more attention to before I actually started down the path but um, and this particular version is powered by um, hanging weight. I actually, you could show, I'll show it to you working. It's, uh... some interesting form in it and it's actually quite um, it, it's quite a nifty design but it's probably one of the most simple ones I've seen and yet it's still I'm still struggling at the moment to actually um, make it work the, the way it's supposed to there's a few different versions of a similar similar thing on there I mentioned earlier that there was a, a guy by the name of David C Roy and later on near the end of the um, presentation <coughs> I've included a a, um, a video clip of, of work that he's done and uh, to me that's it, that's what actually set me down this road to start with. I saw that and thought wow if you can make something like that um, you'd be doing pretty well. And he, he sells these items internationally um, for thousands of dollars and works in partnership with his wife who's also an artist. Um, a lot of the stuff he has 
Oh, he's, he does runs by um, hanging weights, therefore gravity, I suppose you'd say. Um, but, but in particular, what really got my interest up again was this idea of these, what they call constant torsion um, springs and escapements. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about that in, further on in the presentation. But So I, I've got, this is where a lot of people um, tend to have their shutters come down a little bit. This is because um, what I'm talking about here is 3D computer design and people think, wow, this is tough stuff and it's, it's tricky stuff and it's boring stuff and if I'm too old to be interested in all this and all the rest of it. But actually, um, there's a program which I use called SketchUp Make and admittedly I've, I've probably used it for 10, 15 years, um, but it's actually really rather easy to um, learn how to use it. So I've, made, I've just made a couple of comments there. Um, it's not everybody's cup of tea, um, but it doesn't need to be expensive to, to try it out. Um, biggest cost you'll find in anything like um, computer-aided design or, or these sorts of packages is the overhead in learning how to use it. And um, But it does allow you to, um, at no cost, I suppose, other than the time that you put these models together, to easily change any layout that you want, to scale things, to put in precise measurements. Um, ultimately, you're looking to, to print out something that you can um, uh, apply to timber or wood and cut out and make patterns or whatever. But the other thing, other thing that you don't, well, I never appreciated it at the beginning when I was using this program, is that you can actually produce some brilliant organic shapes as well, some curves, bezier curves, spline B curves, and all this sort of stuff. It, it sounds a bit highfalutin when you talk about it, but it's actually bulk simple. I mean, on the screen, you can literally go, okay, I want to go from here, it's say at the mouth of the bowl, down to the side, I want to go down roughly like that, put in a few dots. Don't like it, and you just move the dots, and it curves it in an organic way. It's not, it's not a... Um, like a, a line, a fixed line drawing, and you can then print that out, you can cut it out, you've got a template which you can actually hold against the, uh, anything that you're turning on the lathe at any, at any time. I found it really helpful when I was, at once, one time I was making a, um, it was a Japanese doll that I'd made, that's right, and I had to make the sphere for the head, and what, what you can do there is you can actually print the sphere whatever size you want, and put little, maybe five, ten millimetre apart lines there, and then with just using your caliper, calipers, you measure straight off that, you're going to hold it up against the curve and you'll get basically the shape you want, then you just finish it off by eye, obviously. But um, those are some of the things that, um, you, can do it, you can do all this by hand, there's, there's no denying that, but it's fun doing it, I find it's fun doing it by, um, with, with um, these sort of packages as well. There's um, some, um, the other thing you can get with them is, especially with SketchUp, is these things called plugins. So if you want... Um, for example, if you want to draw, to draw something that's got fillets or coves, or there's a little um, a little tool that you can just download, cost anything, plug it in there, and then have it run on on that as well. Um, so this one here is a is a 30 string <coughs> acoustic harp which I made for my youngest daughter. Um, it's um, I, I was able to use the um, even though that's a lot bigger than an A4 page, I was able to stick the pages together and make the plans necessary. Now, the, the bones of the, the harp are made from teak, which was on a, um, a metal um, Im imported steel sample. It was the pallets that went around it, but it was quite good teak, so I managed to get that. The, the sound box, which you can only just see the edge of that works around there, is rosewood, and the um, sound board is um, spruce. The second one decided that she wanted a clock. And, well, actually, how the conversation started, she rang me one day and said, oh, I want to, I want to commission you, Dad, to make, to make me something, something to go on the wall in the lounge. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. She's trusting her father to actually make a piece of artwork for her to go on the wall. And I said, oh, and she said, well, it has to be a particular size. And she gave me some dimensions. I thought, I can work with that. And it has to be a clock. And it has to look like this clock, and then you send me a plan. So well, it wasn't really <laughs> uh, any trust at all. But that's, um, it's actually quite a big clock, and it's got one, it's got a larger one of the larger movements in it, and quite big hands on it. But it's made of um, black mahogany uh, on all the discs. The, the spokes are all um, Rimu dowels, which were I'm going to say handmade, but I made a little jig with the router to, to feed them through with the drill and worked them that way. But it was quite fiddly. Um, doing it, but that, that worked out quite well. But again, all the placement of the of the dots was done on a on a um, <coughs> um, basically on a drawing package, and then laid out. If I didn't like it, just moved them. It was as simple as that. 
um, the next one then is um, this is traditional German um, nutcracker, and I've, I've actually made a few of these over the years. This one was made for um, a family member. It had to be slightly bigger than the other family members' one, so it was, but it's just a matter of scaling it up. And again, it's, I think it's mostly, um, it's mostly macrocarpa painted, um, but it's a black wood on the, the disc on the base, which was a failed bowl, but I was able to use that as a base for it. Um, what else? I'll, I'll talk a bit later on about it. Something else you can do when we get to talk about a little bit about printers and things that you may or may not realise you can do with a standard bulk simple home office home printer um, and that's to do with um, the painting but we'll talk about that a bit further on. Um, the next one was a lot of fun painting. Um, this is a um, this little guy is supposed to be I don't know older people might re recognise him as Geru Gairo Gearloose's helper yeah, yeah. and it was that was when I was at the um, North Shore uh, wood turning group it was a competition to make lamps and it's um, it's it's basically just it was a lot of that, that's all Pahu to car with the the dark darker timber I think the the shoes and the hands are, are, are lime wood I can't remember what the base was made out of. Again, it was the life. My life was made a lot simpler by having the fact that um, you know you could actually draw it up and turn it up. And I mean, the, the wiring actually goes up through that centre stalk, so you had to be a little bit careful about how you did all that sort of stuff. Um, oh, okay, I'm going to make claim to something here, which is um, make claim to having made a grand piano, but it was only six inches tall, and it was for another relative who makes dolls' houses, and that was that was actually a lot of fun. But again, using other things other than timber, that the keyboard is just printed, uh, you know, printed on on glossy card and, and glued to it. But um, it was a lot of fun making it. The uh, I just made some points up there. Things you can do with a standard home office printer. Obviously, you can print out patterns, uh, printing out full size plans. There's a guy called Matthias bon Bundle, who is a he has a whole lot of he has a really big um, YouTube presence and he's worth um, he's worth following because he's he produces some amazing videos and all sorts of things but <clears throat> he also produces a, a piece of software which you can I think cost 10 20 bucks if you want the all the any advertising removed from it but it means you can actually print anything any size and it'll just continue to print out A4 pages however you want it however you want them and I think he shows in his example he shows a headboard full-size headboard which he's actually made up there it's and he's actually I, I, only reason i'll put his name up there is i don't have any interest in his commercial success or otherwise he's an incredibly interesting guy with some of the stuff he does um well, of course the other thing that you can do with um is your standard printer is, is and you can do this in, with text as well if you do it in reverse you can actually print out on paper and using something like either liquitex or aquatex um paint it on, put the, put the paper print side down, as soon as it's dry, sponge it off, and all you're left with is the text, not the paper. And that's, I haven't actually, to be honest, I haven't actually done that. I've been tempted to do it a few times. I've seen some pretty impressive results from people who have done that, and I'm, I'd certainly give it a go at some point. I just haven't ever got, gotten around to doing it myself. What's the product that you use, Doug? Um, well, there's a couple of them. One's, well, in fact, there's more than a couple, but the two, two that I know of are called Liquitex, and Aquatex, and basically it's an acrylic um, clear varnish, it's as simple as that. But the other things will work as well, including thinned out PVA and stuff like that. So um, it's just something to keep in mind. So this is a little um, little picture of a, by a company called Vulcan Springs, and what it's illustrating is, you'll see that this is a spring which isn't like a normal clockwork spring. What's, what it's actually doing, it's being unwound from that reel, and it's restoring itself to that reel when he's taking the pressure off there. And the reason that I wanted to explain that was because it, it took me a long time to get my head around this. Um, a normal clockwork spring, you wind it up, and the tighter you wind it, if you measure the tension on the end of the spring, the more tension you're going to get there. If you turn it 10 times, it's whatever it is. If you turn it 20 times, it's a lot more than that. It's, and it's, it's, that, that's the reason that in a clockwork clock, it ne you need an escapement. And you need something to regulate the fact that um, when you first wind up the clock, it's pulling it 
however many newtons it's being pulled at versus when the spring's nearly unwind, unwound, it's not pulling it anywhere near as fast. And that's the reason for pendulums which take longer to, um, or that take the same length of time to do their oscillations. That slide, the sole purpose of that slide is to explain the difference between um, a clockwork mechanism with a, with a spring that that's wound under torsion versus a constant torsion. The only force that's coming from that spring there is in that part that transitions from there to there and it's constant across the whole length of the spring. So, um, But I will, will make one other point there is if you do, um, you do need an escapement to control these springs and these drives. If you let them go they just accelerate and and another time I'll tell you how I know that, but um, <laughs> it's, um, it's something you do need to control. Now that's, so that talks about the motor part, and then there's the escapement part. And this, the escapement part is where I re really did come unstuck, because it was much, much more difficult than I ever um, envisaged it was going to be. This is another David C. Roy um, quote, but why I put this one up is because there's some quite detailed views you'll see of the actual escapement part. And it's deceptively complicated. What, what's actually happening is the wheels are, are rotating. Those little deep, or that little detent there is actually counterweighted. And I think I looked very carefully. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's a, a magnet included in there somewhere as well. But eventually it gets to the point where it actually drops. And that allows the thing to reverse rotate um, and run the other way. And that, that's where you get the whole... Um, and this is just one of the many mechanisms he uses. All of my sculptures need to be wound. To wind Monarch, you hold the back wheel and then rotate the front wheel clockwise for 22 turns, let it come to rest, and release the back wheel. It should run continuously for seven to eight hours. Okay, and I think this one's called um, Solo, but and you, you'll kind of get the idea why in a minute when they pan out from it a bit. <clears throat> here's, here's his um, constant torsion spring set down here. And he's, he's geared it up with that loop there. <coughs> that loop transfers to the escapement up there. <clears throat> Engineer. I've actually got a, um, a shaft which is, is can't even see without my glasses. <coughs> has a slit down it, which the intention is to that'll capture a spring. There's a couple of bearings here, and they need to be located onto the uh, main shaft. But that was that was part of the, the bigger wheel um, part of it. So those those are the sorts of things. They're not these things are not expensive. It's just that they're there, and you just need to know to look for them. And it's as simple as that. All right, so that's pretty much it.
Um, and this is anything else? Yep. Okay.